Hello everybody and welcome to The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium or today in your terrarium jar, whatever. Any case, today I have something really exciting that I want to share with you guys that is just groundbreaking, revolutionary stuff in the world of science. So the way I spend my Friday nights wild, crazy Friday nights, is usually by reading journals. Ecology journals, nature journals, ichthyology journals, uh, you know, things like that. Chemistry journals. And uh, I came across this journal article last week uh, in the Journal of uh, Ecological and Evolutionary Methodologies. Sounds like a thrilling read, doesn't it, guys? But... It is, to me anyways. So what I'm going to do is condense all this for you, which is some really groundbreaking stuff that's going to change the way uh, we are able to discover new species and also find out when species are present somewhere where they shouldn't be. So for instance, selling illegal fish at a pet store or at a selling uh, cuts of meat that are from an endangered animal. So this can apply to a lot more than fish, but specifically this started with people interested in tracking down fish uh, being illegally traded because it's such a huge issue in Asia, Southeast Asia, such a huge food staple there that a lot of it goes on uh, right out in the open and also behind closed doors. So it's just a problem all around. But first I need to explain to you guys a couple things. So there's a team uh, at MIT we're going to talk about. There's a team uh, at uh, the University of Hong Kong we're going to talk about. And then we're going to talk about, right now, the background of this technology, which is uh, lowercase letter E, uh, that might be, the, okay, whatever, uh, E-DNA, uh, and then DNA as in the normal acronym. That stands for environmental DNA. And what it is, is if I have to make a metaphor, I hope this works, I know it's a little weird, but you know when you shred papers uh, for like like uh, papers that need to be confidential and you put them through a paper shredder and it turns them into strips of uh, confetti or whatever. So think of what I'm about to say like that. So think of a given environment. So let's say you're uh, in a river and in that river... There are bass, there are salmon, there are uh, trout, there are um, catfish, and there are gar. So we'll just say there's five, right? Well now, with eDNA, what it's, it, what it's doing is it is basically taking these piles of shredded paper and it's able to, with computers and databases that are going to become more and more um, populated worldwide and more and more shared worldwide, is they have already sequenced the DNA for a trout, for instance. And they've already sequenced the DNA for all five of those fish that we just mentioned. Well, now they can use not just a cell from those fish, but... If you are hanging out a human in your house, you may have heard that like a billion percent of your dust is human cells, right? Okay. Well, it's it's not like 80 or 90 percent like a lot of the old wise tales say. I, I've read anywhere from 10 to like 30 percent of the dust is some sort of human cells or hair or something, which which is still pretty high. But a lot of it is dead cells. Me just doing this or this, often a hair goes out a little bit of uh, light flaky stuff that's dead skin cells, you know? You'll see it with your own hands. I mean, literally rub your hands together and see if any little white dots uh, go falling, you know? Uh, okay, that's kind of gross, don't do that. But my point being is that these cells and parts of cells go everywhere. And within those, there's DNA or parts of DNA. And when you talk about an aquatic environment, it actually gets moved around a whole lot. So, especially if it's a river, you've got everything that's up river coming down. And what they're now able to do with environmental DNA that is so freaking incredible is they can find these 
little strips of paper, like I was talking about, shredded in the dumpster, which is, the dumpster is the river. Let's say it's a really nice, pretty, pristine dumpster, okay? Because I don't like calling a river a dumpster. But uh, let's say it's that, and they, they are getting these strips of paper, and, and they're able to take a, a single vial. Maybe they stir up some water, and then they s scoop through it. And in that vial, there are little fragments all over that represent those strips of paper. Well, when they have the same, when they have copies of all five pieces of paper that represent those species in a library, then they don't need to tape together the whole thing. They can use uh, extracellular DNA, is what they call it, but that's basically DNA that's not complete, that's fragmented. And then they can compare, for instance, okay, well, this one's from uh, the catfish family. This one's from uh, salmonids of some sort. And we know that because the one chunk we found here uh, is the part that's always found in all salmon or whatever. So just like uh, we may be 98% uh, the same DNA-wise as a, a, a silverback gorilla in the Congo, um, and maybe 98.2% the same as a chimpanzee, all that DNA that evolved for three billion years or two billion years of life is similar. I mean, we are like, I don't remember the exact numbers, I might be wrong here, but we're like 30% the same DNA as a banana, just because we have the same cellular interactions that life created up to, you know, uh, 400 or 500 million years ago or a billion years ago, whenever we branched off with the various things. But you always hear these comparisons. Like a mouse is 80% the same DNA as a human, or whatever the quotes are. I'm not saying those are the accurate things. But because of that, we're then able to say, okay, well, this is going to go into this slot. This is a vertebrate. It's a fish. It goes here. This is uh, a little piece of hair, and we're seeing a sequence from a river otter. So that goes here. And pretty soon you get more than just the, the five fish species. You're getting bacteria, you're getting archaea, you're getting newts, salamanders, anything that went in that river and cells shed from, there's a chance you'll get them. So there's a team at MIT that I need to talk about quickly, and they are statisticians. So you may have also heard this tr in a trivia setting, but you are breathing in billions of billions, if not more, atoms every time you inhale a nice big old breath of air well that air that o2 that nitrogen that carbon that co2 that co everything that's in there has been traveling around the world it's been in the house plants in the room with me it's been uh into the water uh and and these different cycles uh take different lengths of time but when they are looking at ecology, they're able to say like, you know, this is a carbon uh, dump or a carbon um, sink, they call it, like the kitchen sink, where this carbon is out of rotation. So all the, the living organisms that had carbon got locked away and it rotted and became, for instance, oil or tar or whatever. Well, most things, though, go into circulation and get reused. And so, statistically speaking, they've worked out that you are probably breathing at least one atom of oxygen that Napoleon Bonaparte breathed. And you may have heard uh, that Hitler or Gandhi or, you know, whatever, whoever you want to say uh, that was a historic feature, if it's been enough time for these molecules and atoms to move around, uh, there is a kind of set statistical window in which they say you could do, so that, that, that it could be true. And it may be that you are breathing a atom, statistically speaking, that you're breathing from a T-Rex that died in Missouri. And so am I. And so is everyone else. That's how many freaking atoms there are in just breathing in, you know, a few uh, cubic uh, or like half a cubic yard of, of oxygen and air, you know, not of oxygen, of air. 
And uh, so these stati statisticians are able then to say, well, in a lake that is uh, 15 kilometers wide by 10 kilometer, you know, or whatever the volume is of the lake and how much it moves, you need to sample this amount of water to st statistically get a sample that represents the whole thing. So they've been able to team up with that, team up with databases online, add all this together, and then when the human malware uh, virus issue came up two years ago, this team in Hong Kong that this paper was published by basically said, you know what? let's do that thing with the river and the sheets of paper that were shredded and putting them together to figure out what species are in a river. Let's go to those wet markets where they were looking for where the virus started, where the outbreak started, and let's go to the drains where they hose off all the fish that are being gutted, descaled, cut into uh, fillets and whatnot, and let's test that water. Not only that, they test all the drains in the market. Then they find out when they run their samples, oh, there's 15 parts per million of endangered uh, catfish in this one. There's endangered stingray over here. And they might find that the closer they get, they can heat map even to like which part of the market that those cells are coming from, where the, the highest concentration is of that DNA, of that uh, of that extracellular DNA. And at that point, it may be cellular DNA. They might actually be getting like whole samples of blood coming down the drain, but they only need a little fragment to know uh, what species it is. And you focus on the difference in the genome, not the stuff that's all the same. That may help you say, okay, it's a mammal, it's a fish, it's bacteria. But we're focusing on the difference so that you can say, quickly with a computer, you don't process the stuff that's all the same. You don't need to run all that. You just run the part that's going to be different after you've run enough of the other part to establish, all right, it is going to be a fish. It is going to be a this. It's going to be a that. Well, the cool thing is this is already predicted to be able to, if you think something's extinct in the wild, run this eDNA in the lake or in a pond, get a few samples from around the place, and you should be able to tell uh, statistically, you should be able to figure out with how much uh, water moves around and all that, how, uh, and X amount of volume being tested. You should be able to know that that creature is either there or not anymore. And I think that's just mind-blowingly cool that we are at that stage. Well, now we're getting to the stage where this technology is getting small enough to be portable on a laptop. You know, you're linked to a worldwide network uh, with all these samples and things. And when this team at... <laughs> Uh, Hong Kong decided to run these tests at the wet market in Hong Kong. They found eight species of fish that shouldn't have been there. So they said, you know what, let's take this to a bigger city than Hong Kong, which is a big city. They said, let's go to Shenzhen, let's go to Guangzhou, let's go to Shanghai and test their markets. The other thing could be a row of fish stores and they throw their fish water out or they pour it down the drain when they do water changes. If they have an unlicensed arowana in there, I mean, first they're going to, obviously DNA can't tell if it's licensed or not, but maybe it can. Maybe it can tell you the lineage on the farm that it was from if you process it further. But right now you just need to figure out enough to say, okay, that is an Asian arowana, that is a, you know, red, whatever arowana, and that this is coming from somewhere up this street and then follow it back up. You might have to retest and depending on how quickly the turnaround is, they could be doing this in real time in the near future, but right now they may be just be able to say that, you know, every week we're seeing this showing up in this drain. Let's go down to that market. And then now, even if the fish are already cut up, instead of like in the past having to have the whole fish and a picture of the fish and knowing, now they can suspect something. That's enough to get probable cause in a lot of places. And it depends on the country, it depends on the situation, but then they can track down and if they know word of mouth is this person selling stuff then they can go to that person they can take a swab or a little tissue sample of the fish that's been chopped up that's there and boom they've proven it's been poached so they found 19 samples in uh shenzhen which is a huge city i mean like 15 million people or something like that 20 million people uh but in their wet market they found 19 endangered species they found 
groupers, Okinawan loaches, uh, endangered amphibian DNA, uh, endangered, um, uh, yeah, several groupers, several sea brims, uh, and, you know, all sorts of uh, lampreys and eels that were on the list. So, uh, a giant stingray, very interesting stuff. But that's where I'm going to leave you because the future is so bright. Uh, I got to wear shades. I mean, <laughs> okay, sorry, bad joke. But in any case, I hope you guys are ex as excited about this as I am. I think it's really cool. And uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, a thumbs up would be great, especially if you made it this far. If you want to subscribe, I do four videos like this a week for members uh, in the community tab, but then I do several videos a week uh, for everyone. We talk about history, talk about breaking news science, and we talk about just hanging out and talking about aquariums, fish, and freshwater, ecology, biology, aquascaping, and nonsense. So uh, I hope you guys have a great day. Uh, if you want to support the channel even more, I don't believe in paywalls for educational stuff. So anything I do, even for the members, gets out to the public eventually for free. But if you do want to support what I do here and you're having a good time, it's a buck ninety nine. It's always going to be a buck ninety nine, and. Uh, it really helps to have that support. But I hope you guys have a great day, and I'll talk to you next time on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. Bye, guys.